there was a lot of good meat in our service this morning, particularly as relates this class is content. So I just want to bring up a, a couple of points. Number one, the purpose of the class is to learn how to manage the resources that God gives us so that we can be the best cheerful giver that we can. Not so much that everything that we do in this class and the things that we teach in this class can be used in your daily life, but also allow us to help others. That is the primary thrust of this class. So if you're looking for that today, a lot of the content doesn't really hit that, that hard, but just remember that's the background in which this is done. Also, uh, being a person who spends too much is like being that smoker who can't quit. It's a, it's, a, it's a challenge. And before you can be successful, you gotta be all in. You gotta really be all in to dedicating yourself to making the life changes that this type of activity requires. And if you're not gonna be all in, you need to pray about why you're not all in. We've had a week off, and then we had a class, and then we had two weeks, or was it three? I guess it was two that we were off. And this is the first of three consecutive weeks <laughs> that you're gonna have this class. So maybe the people who aren't here today will try to catch up. If you care to go back and look at the videos, they are taping these and they're, on, they're posted on our website. You can go back and actually start at the beginning and bring this all the way up. It's easy to follow more if you've got the background of it. So if, if, if you would, avail yourself of that, that information. And also, I got to thinking about, hmm, wrangling our finances. Really, we're wrangling our management of his resources. Maybe I ought to change that next before next week. But, uh, you know, the whole idea is we have responsibilities that God gives to us when he allows us to have things. And really, we don't have things. They're all his resources. Well, so let's sort of move on in today. Today's lesson is subtitled, Saving Strategically. We want to understand that you have to be able to accumulate and hold in a certain place resources so that you can, I don't know about you, but my life is full of ups and downs. You know, this week I have this expenditure, next week I have different expenditures, sometimes I have unexpected expenditures. Life and the world of the finance is like a roller coaster. May we all enjoy the ride up and not be so fearful when we hit the downs, downturns. We are only promised though, our God has promised us, he will provide for our needs. And as we talked last time, we do not need as much sometimes as we think we do. So as we start today's lesson, let's think about Proverbs 30, 25. Ants, ants are creatures of little strength, yet they store up their food in the summer. Hmm, what does that really mean? They prepare for the future events. They know the winter's coming, that the food that they're going to need through the winter is not going to necessarily be there. So they have to take the life cycle into consideration. They have to, they have to prepare while the food is, is, a, is plentiful and then when the things become, when plant food becomes less plentiful, they have enough to get through the cold winter months. Also, Proverbs 22, three, a prudent man foresees the difficulties ahead and prepares for them. The simpleton goes blindly on and suffers the consequence. I don't wanna be a simpleton. I don't wanna be. 
So we have to prepare and plan. Now let's talk about one of my favorite things. We need to prepare for situations that will arise. And we require that our cash flow generates in a short, it will require more than what our cash flow generates. So we create an emergency fund, an emergency fund. So do we really need an emergency fund? Does anyone believe we don't need an emergency fund? I'm sure you've heard of Murphy's Law. If anything can go wrong, it will. But do you know about Corrigan? Corrigan's got a corollary to Murphy's Law. And Corrigan says, Murphy was an optimist. So be prepared and prepare for the worst. Just simply saying, sometimes things will come up that you don't expect. My wife and I went with our son to Alaska the week before Christmas. We got back into town the day before Christmas Eve. We arrived at the airport in Dallas. We knew we were not gonna be able to make our connection there to get to the next place. So we rented a car and started driving back from Dallas so we could get back at the time that we thought we would get back. And sure enough, we made it back by five o'clock or a little before that afternoon. But about 3.30, my cell phone rings and it's my grandson. He says, uh, how do you turn the water off? <laughs> how do you turn the water off? I said, out at, the, out at the meter. And I said, you know where the tools are. And sure enough, he was able to turn the water off, but we had a pipe burst in the wall that's connected to an outside faucet uh, in our smaller garage. And he got it cut off within about five or 10 minutes after it started. So we were lucky there. I then started thinking, who am I gonna to call to get it fixed? We had this happen in February when we had the snowmageddon, except that time three pipes burst. And I thought I'd taken care of it with with things on the outside of the house and wrapping them up and all that. But I uh, started calling plumbers. The last time I tried to call plumbers, I called plumbers for two days, trying to get someone to come out and repair the pipe. I called a plumbing company that advertises on the radio and TV quite prominently. And they said, well, can we come out on Tuesday? This was Friday. Can we come out on Tuesday? I said, no, I can't go without water till Tuesday. I've got my son and his family and the four of us that live together normally. I just can't go for that period of time through Christmas day without water. So they said, well, let me see what I can do. Well, they called me back in about 15 minutes and they said, uh, can we be there in about an hour? Well, I said, yes. Knowing my grandson was still in the house, he could let them in to the place to get to it. But I pulled into the driveway about 4.30 and by quarter of five, they were in there fixing it. And by five o'clock, they were done and gone. But he handed me a rather hefty bill. <laughs> he was there for 15 minutes. You all heard the story about the plumber and the brain surgeon? The plumber and the brain surgeon. Similarly, the brain surgeon had a problem with his plumbing on a holiday weekend and the brain surgeon calls the plumber and the plumber comes out, fixes the problem, hands the brain surgeon a bill for $250 and he said, but you were here for just half an hour. And he says, I'm a brain surgeon and I don't make that kind of money. And the plumber replied, when I was a brain surgeon, I didn't either. <laughs> uh, so, so, you know, I, I felt really bad when I first heard that story about the $250 bill from the brain surgeon. Mine was $350, but I was still glad to get it done. But fortunately, 
I had prepared. So, how much do we need to take care of unexpected events? What do you think? How much needs to be in your emergency fund? I'm sorry? Most literature says to save up for about six months. Yeah, but that's emergency plus the, the general cash flow type of fund. Um, that's true. That, that's what they say, three to six months. And if you're ever doing mortgages, they like to see a cushion in your cash resources, right, Joanne? Uh, they like to see a cushion of at least three months in there when they're doing the underwriting of your mortgage loan. But the emergency piece, how much is enough? What I was always taught when I was a tot was you needed 100 to $200. Well, that, that plumber wouldn't have taken, care, taken, taken my little bit uh, he, he wouldn't have done that, but after a while it rose up to like $500 today, 1000 and I would offer maybe 1500 is more appropriate for meeting those really unexpected things. At least if you have $1,500 that you can put your hand on real fast, you can get most things taken care of, and if you can't, it shows you've got enough financial wherewithal to maybe work out a payment plan for the residual. But it does vary from household to household. It will vary based upon your situations. A person who's single and living alone and has no responsibilities for others can get by with a little bit less than a person who's got those that they support. And you never know when one of your children, I, I know those of us who have adult children never have them call upon us when they get into an emergency, right? Um, they, those, those, I've sort of tried to make up for their inability uh, to, to take care of things. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. But when you're thinking about this on a longer term perspective, as Kia brought up, you need to say, what would my life be like if I was all of a sudden unexpectedly unemployed? Now, how much would it take for you to make it through if you all of a sudden unexpectedly were unemployed or you had your cash flow if you're retired and your cash flow was all of a sudden interrupted? Well, the politicians took away your social security payments. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, they talk about that a lot in the news. I don't know that that's realistically something that they could do. They all want their power too much, uh, maybe. <laughs> they want, they, that's sort of the rail no one wants to touch. Um, that's sort of a good thing, but it's also sort of a bad thing because they have taken the money out of the trust and used it to other purposes. But as, so long as the government's able to borrow, and that's questionable. If, as long as the government's able to borrow, they should be able to fund that. Probably in preference to a lot of other things that they could be cutting. But how much do you think it would take? You need to answer that question for yourself. If you suddenly had no income, what expenses would you immediately eliminate? Give me, a, give me an expense you'd eliminate. Okay. <laughs> Netflix, Hulu. Okay, those are good ones. All right, what else? What else would you cut? Take out. Huh? Take out. take out. I actually do take out. I don't call Grubhub or people that come to the house with food. I don't know where it's been. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Just thinking. What, but what else, what, else could you, what else could you afford to cut out of your expenses? And, and if you look at that amount that you can cut out, what is that a percentage of as your 
monthly ongoing regular expenses. The smaller it is, the more vulnerable you are. I think about my ancestry subscription or my online newspaper subscription. I would miss it, but I could do away with it. Um, and then I've got Prime, you know, Amazon Prime. I like that free delivery. It's not free, is it? Uh, you know, I could cut that out. And there's, you know, just a lot, lots of things. Hulu, uh, YouTube TV, I mean, whatever you're, you could, you could cut out your, your uh, subscription to, to our, our friends at Spectrum. Um, a lot of places you can get. And, you know, if we're smart, we start thinking about those things and we start looking for other ways we can save. Do you have assets that can be converted to cash? Hmm? Do you have assets that can be converted to cash? Because if you don't have the reserve, I would offer you might be find yourself better off by liquidating some assets and setting that cash aside to build up your cash reserve. Because if you're forced to sell something and you really haven't prepared, you're going to get less for it than if you try to sell it, not needing it now. You can convert cash assets to cash. It can be a lot of things. You can sell almost anything online today. Almost anything. I don't know how to do it. I have to get one of my kids to show me, but I, I know that they, they're, they sell stuff online all the time. And they don't necessarily use, is it eBay? They don't necessarily go that. Oh, by the way, I hear that there's a fee for the using of eBay. I don't know what it is, but why should I pay someone to help me do something I could do without them? And would you, what would you be willing to do to supplement your income if you suddenly lost your job? Anybody suddenly lost their job? Okay. Let me raise my hand. I suddenly lost my job. The year was 1989. Was it 89, Marilyn? Yeah, it was 89. Yeah, 89, June the 8th, to be quite specific. Uh, I worked for a bank at the time, and I was the CEO of this little bank, and I caught my directors doing some things that weren't within the bounds of the law. And if you find something like that, you're beholden as the CEO to write the regulator and tell them what you found. Uh, on Friday of the preceding week of, of uh, June the 8th, I found this thing and I wrote the letter and sent it in to the FDIC. And the following week, on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, I, well, on Monday I had my wisdom teeth cut out. That was the start of the week, and that was going to be the good day. <laughs> uh, on Wednesday of that week, I'm home recuperating from having four wisdom teeth cut out at one time, and I get a call from this guy with a federal uh, police agency, the one that's in the news a lot. They wanted to know where my evidence was. And I told them I wasn't at work and that it was in my desk in a drawer on the lower left side. And then the guy said, okay, who can let me in there? And I gave him the name of the auditor that worked for me. And uh, he let him in, got the, got the file. And then on Thursday, I went to work. And the vice chairman of the board's son, who was also on the board, met me as I was walking in from my company provided vehicle into the building. And he walked me back to my office and he said, your services are no longer required. 
please get your personal stuff out of your desk right now while I stand here and I will have the auditor drive you home. my income went from comfortable to non-existent. Now, that was a very, very scary time. I was not well prepared for that scary time. I should have been prepared because I knew I had written a letter, but I hadn't thought much, given it much thought about what I had to do or what the result would be. What was the result? The, the result of the bank was the chairman of the board was indicted uh, for uh, malfeasance, and then he then later filed bankruptcy and then was further charged with bankruptcy fraud. And um, uh, last time I saw him was the day that I had to testify uh, at the uh, grand jury hearing in Roanoke, Virginia in 1990. So I really don't know where he spent the next several years, or even if he's still alive. Needless to say, I don't. I, those aren't my close friends. Uh, <laughs> but it is. It is a real situation. Even anyone can lose their income, and it can be a very, very unsettling, scary event. And you need to prepare for it. You need to prepare for it. No one, no one is immune. Have you developed a network of friends who might be able to help you find a job? That's a good thing to have in your quiver. That same day that I was driven home, first thing I did is I, I was driven home and I went in the house. Marilyn says, what are you doing here? And I, and I told her. So we both cried. And then we prayed. And then we drove about 65, 70 miles to Knoxville, Tennessee, where I knew a lot of people in the business. And before I drove back to our home, I had a job to go to the next morning. God answered my prayer, but I was unprepared. And beginning that day and every day thereafter, I've always thought, about what happens to me if I lose my income. That is something that's all too real and we all need to be prepared. You can have a short-term goal, and that's the emergency fund. But as we mentioned earlier, you can, build, you can sell assets to build cash, you can take a part-time job, uh, dedicate those earnings to build the emergency fund. There is a guy who I'm not endorsing, who, but he was also a graduate of the University of Tennessee, uh, who his name is uh, Ramsey, you may have heard of him, Dave Ramsey. He graduated nine years after I did, and he got a better gig. Um, but uh, he's been through some trials uh, in his financial life, and he suggests that sometimes even taking a job delivering pizzas is a way to get things done. There are lots of different ways, lots of, lots of, there's lots of em temporary employment opportunities now, but I warn you, they're, they're dwindling. They are dwindling. Yes, ma'am. We don't need a whole loaf. I had too many years of whole loaves. Um, but uh, yeah, you can, you can get, something is better than nothing. Um, my mother used to tell the, the story to me when I was a child of the three little kittens. They lost their mittens. And mom said, I'm gonna take your pie away. Therefore you shall have no pie. Some pie is better than no pie. Yeah. So, the emergency fund we need to have is the free money. After that, after you get that, you need to be looking for free money. There is free money out there. Many of you have jobs, or if you're still working, and that 
have an opportunity for matching of certain funds that you put into retirement plans. You need to start as early as you can the building up your retirement funds. By the way, when I was still in banking, we would allow people to claim the vested portion of their 401ks as part of that cushion that's used in the underwriting process. So don't let that, because you can go borrow against it, or you can do an, you can do an extraordinary withdrawal under some s severe circumstances, and sometimes get away with doing that without a penalty. So don't, don't be hesitant about starting to build the, the 401k or other type of fund like that, just because you haven't gotten up to the point where you've got three to six months worth of, of uh, cushion built into your plan. Another way to make that cushion grow faster is to reduce your monthly expenses. You know, six months of $5,000 a month is a whole lot bigger number than six months of $3,000 a month. So, you know, it, you, it, you, can, you can scale that cushion if you need to. They match the funds. Don't necessarily invest more than they will match. Some places will say they'll match 50% of the first 6% you put in. Well, if they're matching 50%, that's 9% of your savings, all right? And that's money that becomes tax-free if you put it into a deferred type of an, of an investment. Some now tell you to go and put it into a Roth type of 401k. I don't know that that's necessarily the best thing to do, but that's, that's an opinion-based type of a decision for you to make. You all understand the difference between a Roth and a traditional? You, your money that you put into it is tax deferred. In other words, you don't pay your income tax on it right then unless you're making a whole lot of money. Okay, there, there becomes a point in time that if you're making more money that you do have to pay taxes on the amount that you put into that. Um, unlike the IRA, I mean a 401k, the money that you put into that is always going to be tax deferred. So fund the 401k first, then the IRA if you're using tax deferred, but Roth works the same. The principal you put in, you will never be taxed on because you've already paid taxes on that. You will be taxed upon the amount that you withdraw that are earnings from, from the fund. Just like when you pull the money out of an IRA, it's that those earnings are taxable. But the thing is, they don't tell you how much you have to pull out if, it's an, if it is a Roth IRA. Whereas when you get to age 73 now, unless you started and were born before 1950, you still are under the old rule where you had to take it out when you attained the age of 70 and a half years of age. They bumped it up from 72 years to 73 years just a few days ago. So you might want to read the press releases about changes. Uh, that was in the year-end spending bill they passed right before the end of the year. So stay, stay, stay attuned to that. Right, right, and and they do have a limit on the on the four hundred one k's now. I think it's nineteen twenty thousand something this year. It was nineteen the last time I had to make a contribution. Um, anyway, uh, I can't contribute anymore. I'm not making any money. Uh, you need to set up a short term goal for saving to the future. Um, I sat down with my children when they got their first jobs, and I sat down and I talked with them about saving for retirement. And sometimes that talk sticks, and sometimes it doesn't. But usually, if it didn't stick then, about 20 years later, they'll, they'll think, I should have started this a little earlier. Uh,
$300 a month, if you could put $300 a month into an account and you put it and you invest it every week consistently, or put money in every week, but three to $400 a month, you can be a millionaire before you retire. By the way, a million dollars doesn't go anywhere anymore. It will not last. Um, it, it, you just can't do it, at least not with the property taxes in Texas. Uh, but you need to, if you have it set up to where you're saving automatically and you don't see it, you never miss it. That is a very good tool to, to, to save. And you really do need to, to do with, deal with that. After you started saving for retirement and the kiddos start coming along, you need to be thinking about how are you going to pay for them to go to school? And when they're old enough to, to understand, you need to share with them what you're doing. Uh, you need to get new batteries for the PCs every now and again. And, uh, but you need to let them know what they're going to do. They may, they may have a Harvard degree desire, but you may have an Alamo Community College budget. Uh, it's okay. Hey, I pay taxes to them. I know they're okay. I sent two of my kids to them. It's okay. Uh, but, they're, but, the, but the fact is, if you're in the San Antonio area, you get a, you get a supplement that's, that covers a, a good portion of the amount of, that goes there. But then you can do two years of community college and transfer over to a four-year state school, and that's probably the least expensive route you're going to find. But, uh, you know, if you start talking to them when they're young, they can st certainly help by maintaining good grades, doing participating in activities that that offer scholarship opportunities do ancestry and see if they're related to anybody that might have a nest egg back in the family tree or or that you are a participant you are a member of a of a group of individuals like I found out I my kids could have qualified for a DAR scholarship because I, we, can transfer, we can trace our lineage back to people who fought in the Revolutionary War. Now, those, those things, you don't, if you don't know you have those, ac those accesses, and the best friend that your student can ever have in high school is the guidance counselor who is really into uh, finding scholarships. They need to know them the first day they go to high school. Uh, believe me, that's... That's, that's really important, but let them know your expectations. I knew I read that someplace. Um, start at a very year, early year and agree on, on, on the limits. I told my oldest child, she wanted to be a nurse and she wanted to go to a school where it's far away. And she worked hard during her high school years and was able to get a $4,000 scholarship that first year. And that made a very, very big difference to her and to me. Well, you know, there's a government uh, farm that we used to like, because I had three children two years apart. What's that called? Do you remember? You, it's a, it comes out from the government, and it's, it's, it's designed to help you with secure financial assistance. FAFSA. FAFSA. Yeah, FAFSA. Yeah, it's a, it's a form that they have to fill out before they can even qualify for student loans. Yeah. By the way, I've made student loans. They're bad mojo. Okay, I'll just tell you up front, particularly now that they privatized it. They took the, what had been a state-run, federally insured student loan program Back in the, in the late 70s, early 80s, they moved it all to centralized into the Department of, of Education. Maybe been a little later than that. But then they started encouraging financial institutions to make student loans. And by the way, if all the money on a loan that's classified as a student loan is used entirely for educational purposes, tuition, supplies, room and board while they're at school, all that stuff, 
those debts cannot be bankrupted against. Those are the only debts other than debts to the federal government you cannot get out of. So, it's, it's bad mojo. There's, and, it, and it doesn't make a sense. Don't let your child go to school get a, a degree in underwater basket weaving. There's not too many jobs in that field. No. Let, them get, let them have a job that has a earning potential to it. So, how much should a car cost? Hmm. What kind of car do we need? I would offer the car that you need is one that will get you from point A to point B consistently and frugally. And 19... 79, 1980, 1980. I come home and I told my wife, we need another car. And she says, and I said, my boss is wanting to get rid of one of his cars. And he, she says, well, how much is it? I said, it's $400. It was a ugly, <coughs> ugly Pinto. It was ugly. That car would not die. It would not die. That car, that car had a radio that didn't work. It had an air conditioner that didn't work. The windows fortunately rolled down. Fortunately, I didn't have to drive too far to work, but it would, gas mileage was unbelievable. A Pinto, yeah, they don't, uh, that's, yeah. Yeah, it's, it, I was really glad I didn't get rear-ended after I learned about that, but that car was ugly. It ruined a suit of mine. Uh, I, the, 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 the passenger seat was worn so thin, the springs would come up and they tore the trousers on my suit. That's when I decided to get rid of the car. My suit cost almost as much as the car, okay? I couldn't afford that. But... The bells and whistles, they don't add a whole lot if you're getting rid of the car. They really don't. They just really don't add much. So what are you willing to forego? What was that thing he was talking about in the, in, when uh, Dr. Martin was speaking? Uh, oh, ego? Okay. Enough said. Vacations. Hmm. Vacations really are the bottom of the barrel when it comes to, to, uh, to savings plans. You know, my wife grew up in a family where they took a vacation to a relatively small family-owned hotel down in Daytona Beach. They drove there. It took them about six or seven hours to get there. But they, were, they went there every summer and they allotted the money for that. My dad was cheap. <laughs> I inherited that gene. We went on vacation four times, as I recall, in my life before I got married. Four times. And in those four instances, three of them, we went to state parks inside the state of Tennessee. So he was, and I was 15 years old before I ever went to McDonald's. And McDonald's was around a while before that. And hamburgers there were only 15 cents at the time. But daddy would, he would, he would stop at a grocery store on the side of the road and go in and get a pound of bologna and a loaf of bread and that was supper. Okay, that was, that was it. It was where his priorities were is where his priorities were. And that's, this is sort of translated into what I'm saying now. Priorities need to be scaled, but they're individual, okay? There's nothing wrong with having a good vacation. Nothing wrong at all. I know people who spent tens of thousands of dollars on a vacation for their family. It's not something I would do, but if I haven't got my savings up to where it needs to be, 
it should be the bottom of the list, at least as far as I'm concerned. Taking a whole family to Disney World is expensive. Really, really expensive. I don't know. Marilyn and I have been twice with our kids. And the price doubled between the, that, the first one when we went the first time, it was like $39 a piece to get in for one day. Last time I heard it was like almost a hundred bucks a day. It's per person, per person. I fortunately grew up close to Dollywood. She's not that expensive or didn't used to be. It's been a long time since I've been there. Creating savings is work. Negotiation is the art of getting your expenses down. There are companies now that actually do negotiate for you. One of them is a thing called Rocket Money. I don't know if you've heard of Rocket Money. It is a website, or it's, there's a website right there that's a review of Rocket Money. They come on and tell you that they will monitor all of your subscriptions that you have online, and they will even go as far as canceling your subscriptions for you if you see them coming up and you don't want to renew them. And they'll tell you what you can renew and what your possible savings are. The deal is, though, they charge you a percentage of what they're going to save you. Okay? And you're going to have to do the math for your own self, but I would strongly suggest that you go and look for the word review on rocket money and if someone want if you if you just let me know that you want me to send send you the link to this review but it's very detailed it's unbiased it compares it to other other places that do similar stuff rocket money was the top one they had that did this it ranges anywhere from i think it was three dollars to twelve dollars a month and there is a free version and the guy suggested in the article that you use it for a couple of months get rid of all the stuff you want to get rid of then go to the free version so you can you can change what you're doing with them too um, debt forgiveness companies you're gonna you will probably hear about debt forgiveness companies people will tell you that they'll help you get rid of debt just remember this Forgiven debt is taxable income, okay? In most places, it's taxable income. I've got a copy of the IRS code that tells you that if, you are, if somebody agrees to forgive a debt to you, you're required to pay taxes on the amount that it's forgiven when it is forgiven. And these people will get you to pay them a fee to get the, them to negotiate on your behalf to save you money and on, on your debts. And what you don't know is after the first of the year, you get a 1099C and they say, thank you, we forgave this much money to you and we told the IRS all about it. <laughs> and therefore, they will catch you if you don't pay your taxes on the forgiven money. Um, Two places I suggest, or three places I suggest that you uh, look at for renegotiation. Financial institution account fees. I would shop around those annually, or at least twice it, tw every other year. Insurance premiums, at least three, every three years, you need to go out there and see what you can get on car insurance, or homeowner's insurance, that sort of thing. You can save money if you renegotiate. Otherwise, what you will do is get, this will happen. You get a bill and you're happy with it. You pay it. The next year, it goes up a little bit. Then the next year, Saco. Trust me, I'm living it. My homeowner's insurance doubled from last year. And I didn't file a claim. All I did was get older. Sell your phone companies. You can find a better deal. You can definitely find a better deal. I'm not telling you who to go to. I'm simply saying, if you're smart, you'll go out there and you'll try it and you can save money. Most deals with phone companies now are non-contract account agreements 
and you can get out of them real easy. And if at first you don't like the one you moved to, you can punt and go back to the other one or try another one. But you can save lots of money. Be sure that you have not financed a phone with them when you're doing this. That will get you. If you have financed a phone with them, better to buy a used phone with less features and have it on your person than to lock yourself into a what is a non-contractual obligation. It's a, not a contract obligation to keep your service with them. Well, what they do is they say, well, if you're going to leave, you got to pay me not only this month's last payment, but you got to pay the, the uh, phone bill off. And if you paid $1,200 for an iPhone 14 or whatever, and you still owe 800 bucks on it, that can be a surprise. My time is up. I'm sorry about the interruption. I will better my battery next week. Have a good week.